Welcome to the Caffeine Stream on Caffeine and Philosophy. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 12th episode of the Caffeine Stream. My name is C.V. Robertson, and today on the 12th episode, it feels very appropriate to talk about something I've been wanting to talk about with this particular guest for some time now. Um, we sort of began to discuss it in our first conversation, didn't we? The subject of seasonality. Hello, yes. Um, I am Chris's wife. <laughs> um, I've had one sip of a Mike's Hard, and we're going to have a very fun little podcast. It's way too early to pretend to be drunk. You need to at least finish the beer first. You know what? Uh, I've had three children. I have no tolerance left. I've smelled it. Well, I've had like like three beers already. I probably drink too much. I should probably cut back at some point, switch to kombucha. But you sound... Anyways... Uh, it, it is. It does feel like podcasting on a Friday night is the seasonal time to be enjoying adult beverages with one spouse. So, well, fear not, dear husband. I shall fetch you a kombucha scoby, and we will begin our fermenting journey. <laughs> Excellent. So, so we've been talking about seasonality for quite some time. The subject came up in my investigation into Greek and specifically Homeric heroism. Thanks in immense part to Dr. Greg Nage's wonderful work uh, on the subject. And I suppose etymology is as good of a place to start as any on, on this subject. So seasonality, the, the, the goddess of the seasons in the Greek tradition was Hera, whose name is etymologically related to where we get the word hour from she's she is about time and seasonality and um and that seasonality is connected etymologically with heroes who are also etymologically related hero horda hera they're all tied together heracles is the the glory of hera the glory of seasonality but what dr greg Naj points out is that these heroes are unseasonal they're out of season out of time and place up until the moment of their death. And to me, that implied uh, a, a kind of appropriateness in timing. It's not just the seasons change and times change, but there's there's an, uh, an appropriateness, or in the unseasonality thing, an inappropriateness in, in time and context. Um, but that's at a very abstract and classical kind of level. You've been exploring this at a, at a more household level in the last couple of years. Um, yeah, that's exactly where I wanted to start. Um, you mentioned Hera, and the first thing I thought was that um, if you explore any of the sort of itsy witchy kinds of things, uh, immediately, if you get peg yourself as a green witch or a house witch or a hearth witch, if you so choose, uh, you're often called upon to pick your goddess or person who you are uh, deifying as part of your practice now personally um i mean that's pretty cringe it's it's so <laughs> cringe um yeah um, um some people really get a lot of out of altars and things like that uh do not um <laughs> part of what i think we'll discuss in this episode is that for me like the practice of my paganism is in the way that I'm just kind of following the seasons in a very naturalistic fashion to the point that you might be like, is that indistinguishable from just, you know, drinking your pumpkin spice latte in the fall? And, uh, yeah. you know, they, it's not. It's not super complex for me. Anyway, where I'm going with the Hera thing is to say Hera is, of course, one of the first uh, gods that is gods or goddesses that's usually listed as one of the hearth goddesses that you can you know worship in your practice she's <laughs> she's often listed um there are others that you are probably familiar with because you actually know more about mythology than i do well, well Hest hestia is the hearth goddess hera is is a, uh, I mean she's the the wife of zeus and is off in olympus controlling the seasons in a more in a more cosmic kind of sense I think some people are into her for the fact that she is so generative. And so like if kind of fertility and 
being a like a queen is your thing. Like hair is a good one to call out to. Again, this is a high cringe, guys. It, this is very cringy. Oh, this is the 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 right season to be bringing Etsy into this. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I I feel, and this is I think what we kind of are gonna dwell on. What you have, what you and I have discussed quite a bit because of your work is the this idea of seasonality that to juxtapose someone who is very seasonal is someone who is very like rooted in their time. They are relevant and tuned in to not necess- not just maybe like the quarterly cyclical pattern of the year, but like the era they're in. Well, and and it it feels like you've been homing this in at a at an even more local level, not just in yeah. the 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 seasons of the year, but also of the week and even of the day. Sure. Um, where I, I want to first start by making sure that we explain the difference between what it is to be seasonal versus what it is to not be seasonal. A hero is someone who is unseasonal to the degree that he is, and perhaps you can correct me here. Let's watch your wife, your editor, see if she can <laughs> describe the things you write about. So my understanding, at least, is that an unseasonal person is someone who is trying to be kind of like a an icon. They are achieving pursuing some kind of immortality something that will allow them to live on for you know years and decades people will speak your name you know like they're They're, looking for fame they're a man against time right whereas someone who is very seasonal is someone who's very rooted in their time and so i'm trying to think of uh some examples like from our own history or or pop culture who you might think of um i feel like ernest hemingway is the sort of person that i would immediately think of as being very in his time he's timeless in a like quintessential kind of way but it's almost because he's so at within his time i would i would say cormac mccarthy does this a little bit he's very much a man against his time okay Uh, well i'm trying to think of someone who's in their time oh how about chuck palahniuk Ooh. Ooh, that's a hot take. Okay. <sighs> very postmodernist. So yeah, I mean, I Well, very... I mean, that's in tune with the but but he he's not he's not just embracing postmodernism in a like, oh, this is the thing we're doing. He's he's pacing his audience, yeah. but he's also he's also going somewhere with it that isn't just mm-hmm. following the herd. So he is in his time, but he's not merely of his time yeah i mean if you think just about like the cultural impact that fight club had it's like what he did was kind of create a moment around a trend and a movement that was already developing and existing but just didn't have the words for it so like he described it but it was already it was already there exactly i was i was listening to a podcast that um where Jack Donovan was being interviewed and the interviewer asked him what, what made the way of men stick so well, what made it like just take off in the way that it did. And Jack's answer was, Oh, I think it was the, the, the right book at the right time. It was, there was a, there was a, a need for this. The question was emerging in the aftermath of all of this sort of second and the beginning of third wave feminism and people were were deconstructing these concepts of gender, plus they were being sort of deconstructed by uh, sort of economic and corporate interests that weren't particularly ideological, but were sort of pilfering the honor of the name. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, people were hungering for that knowledge at that moment. And there's a there's a a timeliness of that that leads to success and relevance but i think there's a there's an advantage to seasonality that isn't just this will make you successful and it's one that i feel like is is especially noticeable in this increasingly digital frictionless age where everything is and we can even take it out of the digital realm everything is climate controlled everything is light controlled everything is your environment is controlled in a static way that that, where there is no differentiation and distinction across time Mm -hmm. that leads to a very surreal, uncanny experience of the passage of time and of your life. Mm -hmm. Seasonality and embracing the changes in 
light and temperature and sun and the stars and all like and and even like 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 all of the well so it, it leads to a kind of connection with the experience of living itself beyond just whatever material success might be associated with being on time yeah well so where where i think the being on time is is an interesting thing so i you know i have no aspirations perhaps because i'm a woman i have no aspirations to try to be timeless in any particular way one of the one of the good pieces of feedback that you were given when you were writing um in defense of hatred is that you know a man who speaks of his own time speaks for all time right there's a certain timelessness to being so quintessentially in your time and that that's kind of like a an era's thing or like you know thinking larger trends that are going on in the world um, I feel like, and this is where I start to <laughs> dive into a territory that makes me sound almost, dare I say, nearly almost feminist. I feel like as a woman, I have a particular attunement to the, not just the the other cyclical patterns that exist in the world that are not, um, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, corporate. <laughs> I think a lot of the world is built around um, a man's circadian rhythm and so every day can be essentially the same. Your hormones fluctuate pretty like consistently from one day to the next. Now, obviously, there are things you can do to mess with those things. Um, but as a woman, anyone who's ever met a woman, you're probably acquainted with the fact that like we are not the same over the course of the month. Now, I'm not going to talk about the moon because I'm not into that. But women are very much not the same <laughs> from one week to the next. And learning to ride the rhythms of like your very high energy cycle when you're very, very fond of your husband, and then the um, low energy cycle uh, where you're not fond of anything and nothing is right. Learning how to work with yourself and not work against yourself is something that I feel particularly attuned to. And a lot of the, the reason I'm able to be so aware of that is because I don't work outside of the house. I'm here with my kids. I'm able to just kind of... I, I, it's something about myself I'm able to monitor very closely. It's something obviously that impacts me every day. But also it impacts the kids, it impacts you. The cycles that we're moving through over the course of the year, for me over the course of the month, for my kids over the course of the day are, are rhythms and changes in energy that um, it when you pay attention to them and you don't fight them and you don't say yes, but it's, you know, 12 o'clock and 12 o'clock is lunchtime and we do lunchtime at 12 o'clock and you instead read the room and say, look, nobody's hungry. Let's continue the activity we're already in. Stretch that out a little bit longer. Lunch at 1230 is fine, right? You start you start becoming aware of these very. Uh, so the, the stability, the stability of the framework actually gives you flexibility around the framework because of the existing sort of skeletal structure of the seasonal pattern. Yes, and you can start to pick up on what the energies are. Like if I were to describe to oh, you, because you have a baseline, you have a baseline. Uh, yes, I guess what I'm what I, I'm thinking the, more. The, the seasons and the knowledge of the seasons give you a baseline for where everything and every one should be at a given moment. Mm -hmm. What should a tomato look like? Is a very vague question unless you say, in the middle of July. Uh, like like what your expectations should be are are, are going to be very different depending on the the moment in the seasonal progression. Yes. Okay. I see exactly where you mean. Go. Or I see exactly where you're going with that. Yes. Um, I feel like tracking the energy of the people in your life. Um, not just women. Men have these fluctuations. Also, children do. Everyone does. Is kind of like sensing the weather. You start to pick up on like cloud patterns, and it wouldn't be weird to say that like it looks like it's gonna rain today. Like that's not a strange thing to say. You can wake up in the morning and just feel it in the air that you're like, "Ooh, we might have a thunderstorm later." You can just tell. It can once you start to break yourself out of the idea that every day is the same that you know that basically any day could be interchangeable when you start to turn off your air conditioner to go to bed later in the summer to go to bed earlier in the winter to eat a lot more in the winter you start becoming really aware of just how much energy everybody's putting out and how much foreshadowing and like cluing in people are giving you clues people and also plants also animals are giving you clues to how to treat them and 
the more you can start to shift your brain to thinking to to tuning into those and stopping trying to force everybody into this frankly a very artificial schedule the more like you said the more you're like how should my tomato look in the first week of august versus like in may right if it looks like anything at all in may um i wanted to go back a little bit because you were talking about the 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 particular relevance this subject has to women who are by nature slightly more seasonal than men i don't think that's even a very feminist point necessarily it's it's just an observation not just of a fact but also of a of a degree of of um of expectation Mm -hmm. as well i mean men are expected to be the sort of the sort of unmoved stone in the river now woe to the man who isn't attuned with the seasons of the the people especially the female people around him but like at the same time other men and women expect him to be a kind of bulwark against the 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 rising and falling tides of the seasons around them and to be stable and consistent and so i think when the subject of seasonality comes up it's natural for men to be inclined more towards the the broader transcendental seasons of life and especially that most heroic of all seasons the season of death and how best to approach that coming season that comes for everybody in the end. Whereas with women, like there's less, there's less grounding value in that than in observing the local sort of mercurial vicissitudes of, of your local river eddies of, of changing, you know, children's habits and so forth. All right, that's enough nature analogies. <laughs> um, no, the only thing that makes me sound remotely feminist about that is just the assertion that like the world was built around men's circadian rhythms. Um, I mm. that I mean, it's also built around, frankly, an industrial production floor, which makes me sound a little bit like a communist. So you know, like I I don't think there's anything wrong with acknowledging that like a super when when your expectation is that every day you're going to show up and work at the factory or that every day is the same and you don't have any margin in your in that structure to be able to do like hey it's harvest so like literally everyone is just processing food that's all we're doing we're doing that for now until middle of september and then we'll have a party like that a a very post-industrial i would also say very digital world where literally everything you want is on demand at any time i mean i from my phone, I could get probably a- any meal and like any kind of food at any time of day. And I could probably have it delivered to me. Like I probably don't even have to go anywhere to make eggs or a burger show up at my house. And um, frankly, there's something a little bit off about that. And like you said, it's like, you know, it, it is important for, I think, men, because you guys are a little bit less affected by by those um, energies. I, don't, I think men, especially you can attest to this for little kids <laughs> figuring out what it what these like nonverbal creatures want just by their like mood and temperament and facial expression is like not a man's natural skill i think you'll be a little more useful when they can talk to you <laughs> and they're not so sticky but um what what makes a successful man i think is the one who can look at other people's emotions who can observe those patterns, almost kind of like a, not a disinterested observer, but like a one who is not influencing the thing he is observing, that kind of disinterested observer, and then react to it appropriately to help everybody else be their best self. Because there are times when you're, (laughs) there are times when I'm all over you in like a, hey, we should make babies kind of way. And then there are times when I don't know if I could handle my life if you weren't here to prop me up. And the swings in my energy, they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm an otherwise neurotypical person, but the, the <laughs> oh, why are you even using I don't, that term? I know I shouldn't use, I, I shouldn't internalize that at all. But like, I am a normal person. I am a cognitively healthy human being. We have a great relationship, but that does not mean that there are not slightly more manic periods and slightly more depressed yeah. periods. <laughs> and your stability as your con- like in your constitution 
gives you strength to keep m- me moving smoothly. Yeah. And that's like the the other piece of seasonality that I think is really important is that dynamic between husbands and wives and between men and women. Um, I don't think that men have the capacity, and I hope I don't say this in a derogatory way. I don't think you have the capacity to be that in tune with with more than one person. Uh, perhaps this is my advocacy for monogamy. I really think men can only handle the the vacillations of one woman at a time. Well, maybe not in tune in that way. Uh, I mean, like if you take a guy in his work environment, and then take him, and then he like goes home and spends time with his family. And then on, you know, Friday night, he goes and hangs out with his friends at a bar. He'll be in tune with those different crowds, those three different groups in different ways. Oh, sure. I just mean, I don't think you can be, I don't think you, you can handle, I don't think men can really deeply understand and cope with the vacillations of more than one woman. (laughs) Oh, well, yeah, the, the, the harem model sort of like hinges upon having a bunch of eunuchs that handle that for you, <laughs> you know, uh, but, but I mean, I, I would, I'm, I'm curious. Wh- why do you think that the, the modern world is built upon the male rhythm? Because to me, one of the most, uh, you know, today we, the big sort of seasonal change that everyone talks about is the so-called midlife crisis, um, which is an interesting phenomenon, but I'm the, I think the historically, and we even see it today to a degree, though not as much as perhaps we should, is this 14 to 24 year old range where men are sort of becoming who they're going to be for the rest of their lives. And that's traditionally the heroic age range. And this detached, one might say, solar view of the world that's just not possible. <laughs> they they can't you can't manage that as a no, as a not. as a hormonally healthy male between the ages of 14 and 24. You can't have a detached view. Or, or well, you might if you are very unusual, but you're most likely going to be very passionate about some cause or other. Sure. And and that's normal and that's mm-hmm. maybe even good. Um and that's a that's an important season of a man's life and his development. But I don't yeah. think it's one that the modern world oh, like oh, oh, is built around. What? You don't, no. th- what? Absolutely. Oh, no, I think it crushes honey, that. No, no. Okay. Think about our school system, babe, from age 14 the school until system is what I'm, the school system is what I'm thinking about. No, I know. Okay. So think about this. So take all of the fervor of young men who w- should be doing geometry and gymnastics and no, they shouldn't be doing gym- geometry and okay, gymnastics. Okay, they on, should be on. off at, at war. Well, okay. So short of being at war, the next best thing that a young, uh, was being on the football team. Is being on the football team. Yes. Okay. So think, but hang on. Let me, let me set it up for you. Okay. So from 14 to 18, during your guys' most like young and like athletic, athletically yeah. potential period, mm-hmm. we send you to mm-hmm. high school where you basically do three sports a year and you're supposed to like do school and you're supposed to like work really hard and it's like, freaking proto johns hopkins where everyone's on adderall and like working their butts off all the time and no one's sleeping and everyone's talking about how tired they are when they're 14 and they don't even know the meaning of tiredness nobody's had a newborn yet anyway not that i'm petty about it and then (laughs) and then from 18 to 22 you're supposed to be at college picking your career and working really hard and staying up really late and blah 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 that is all the best now i'm not advocating hedge I am not advocating that young women should get married at like 14 and start having babies. But between 15 and 22 are a woman's most fertile years. That is the peak of my beauty and my fertility and my physical strength. And I waste those years dicking around in high school, (laughs) sitting around in high school, chasing. uh, And here's the thing that really kills me about it. So a man's circadian rhythm on a like on a longer timeline from like 14 to 24 is that like 
proving yourself, developing your potential era, right? And then from 24 to 35, you should be probably like getting married, settling down, having kids. Naturally, if you're sleeping next to a hormonal woman all the time, your home hormones will also drop. The presence of kids reduces your testosterone. You're also getting older. You're probably getting more sedentary depending on what your career is, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, hang on, hang on. Let me set some stuff you're, up here. You're speeding up and I feel like we're getting off off track. You asked me the question, How? why do I think that the world is okay. built around a man's circadian rhythm? And this is why. And then from 35 until you die, you're working and doing stuff and whatever. For a woman, the best time of my life to be having kids, I should be trying to find a husband who ha- already has some status and maybe a homestead and other stuff between the ages of 15 and 25. And then I should be making babies And then I should be raising those babies from 25 until probably 45. And then the best time of my academic life, of my free time and my grandmahood should be from like 55 until I die. When women get caught up in the same, I need to prove myself, I need to be in the rat race with everyone else uh, energy that goes through, you know, basically college then they have to justify the fact that they spent the last four years getting this degree. It's all kind of chasing a man's uh, trajectory. And then the second piece of that, on a more of a daily level, um, your guys' hormones are like, your testosterone is the highest first thing in the morning. And what is everybody out there in the world talking about is like, oh, my 4 a.m. morning routine. And then I get up and then I work out and then I do my meditation. I do all my deep work first thing in the morning, blah, blah, blah. So a lot of the like daily advice that you see on like how to have a productive day is actually built around a man's circadian rhythm. And like the whole concept of like leg day, arm day, core day is like, such a dude's way of working out by the way well so okay so i can see what you're talking about as far as like okay so the 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 planned route impedes the proper path of a woman in a way that it doesn't impede the path of the man and so therefore uh it's built around the man but what i'm saying is that there's a critical phase that a man should go through in order to feel mentally and spiritually connected to his society and to, and to himself. And while, you know, this like natural trajectory, if we want to call it that doesn't like impede finding a spouse at an early age in the way that does a woman, it, it does impede that it does stop. So, so, so it's like, I, I don't, I think the the more reasonable conclusion here, but I want to transition after this into like, okay, so what do we do about this? How do you, how do you, choose a more seasonal life i think the the normal trajectory that is planned for average american children and adolescent adults is not really psychologically well adapted to either men or women it sort of split the difference in an androgynous fashion and doesn't really serve either one very well yeah i think we were just caught at kind of two different levels of abstraction where i'm looking at the current like where i'm more of a um materialist and i'm looking at how it is um how it is currently is somewhat more oriented toward a man's biological schedule and his agendas as far as like he needs to get status he needs to get a career he needs to get some resources he needs to prove himself and develop some skills blah 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 and then so he can have a family and that's really harm like uh, it goes against the natural rhythms that a woman should have so like i think you're i think you're correct that it is an androgynous solution that doesn't work for anyone and frankly i think mostly only works for like uh post-industrial america that wants us all to be in corporations which is the part that makes me sound a little bit like a communist so uh i do love capitalism so don't get it twisted but um well we're gonna have to have a whole other conversation about capitalism at some point Oh, that would have been very fun. Um, I think you're talking about at the level of what should be done yeah. based historically on like how, like what young men should be doing. So yeah. men, I think we're have, just at two different levels of abstraction. Men have positive needs at that particular season that are 
uh, so not, not not denied exactly, but but uh, distracted from. So it's like it's like your your tomatoes need to be fertilized at the end of March, or they're screwed. Uh, and by screwed, we mean they're they're gonna be kind of weak and wilty. They'll they'll still make a few small fruits, but they're not gonna be as nice as you would like. But like like and that that fertilizer for true like masculine energy is being denied and 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 so these these seasons and here we might be stretching the metaphor a little bit yes your Um, your understanding of the germination of tomatoes is a little off but that's so so i'm 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 (laughs) i'm making up dates and times to make the point but hopefully people will be able to grasp it but like i said before i think the most important season of all for for men arguably for women too um is death and it's mm-hmm. one that has been systematically hidden and uh avoided and ignored and pretended as to not exist by much of by much of our culture as well it's we live in kind of siddhartha's palace growing up where all the negative effects are hidden from the young prince uh, in a way that gives him illusions about the nature of life. Uh, I 100% agree with that. Um, and we could also do a very nice lengthy podcast about um, about death and dying and why we should all be less a uh, little less freaked out by it. Not in a like, ooh, we should all like creepily worship it in a dark left-hand path kind of way, but also, but in a like... To, to, uh, to, to uh, understand it and embrace it as a part of life, though. Yes, absolutely. Because I, especially my, uh, to give a Cliff Notes version of my attitude toward death, I think that it is a sad thing that when someone is born, everyone comes to visit. But when people are dying, almost everyone dies alone, uh, probably in a hospital, and then their body gets shuttled away to somewhere. And then if you're a boomer, you get scattered to the ocean, <laughs> your favorite place to be. And there's nowhere to go see you. Um, so for me and for yeah. us, w- a picking a place that is um, somewhere where we can make a-, a pilgrimage place for our children in the future, that's important to us. And um, I think that there should be just as much ceremony around the end of someone's life as there is at the beginning. I don't know that there's necessarily like a wheel of life. I don't believe that people get reincarnated or anything like that, but it's important like birth is beautiful and death is in its own way kind of beautiful too. It's a closure on, you know, a full life. It's, you know, so much past between birth and death. Well, and I think that we, we can generalize from that uh, to a, to a broader point about how, how do you, how would you actually live in a seasonal fashion? And I think the, the main tool that people have used historically to do this is to have periods that draw your attention to the season in an intentional and fun way. Mm-hmm. You have these, you have these holidays. You have mm-hmm. Halloween. You have, you know, Easter, which is you know or has other connotation. Yeah. yeah, but but like it's still even in the Christian sense, it is a it is a renewal and a and a, a return of life. Well, season as well as and the you have these where you have you know yeah. the depths of the darkest longest night versus the longest day right you have these celebrations where that that draw your attention to the season that you're in and make you bring you to mind of where you are in time and space and i think what you're talking about with this sort of irish wake approach to death rather than this kind of uh pretend it doesn't exist um mm-hmm. Very, the, very, uh, I would call it over medicalized. Yeah. I have the same opinion about birth if we want to get into that. Yeah, that this very, the over medicalization like, is sterile, always sterile, fluorescent mm-hmm. lit experience of, of, of death and life is very, is very anti life in a way. Yeah. It's very, it, it fits in with this digital frictionless ideal that. Uh, transhumanist autists are trying to move yeah, us towards. Yeah, and, and just industrialists who are like, let's just make a, you know, make a... Uh, make things more efficient. Yeah, make things more efficient. Because seasons are very inefficient. They are super inefficient. And they, I think that's something you and I have talked about before. Uh, it took me a while to, to kind of figure out what my sort of seasonal rhythm 
was going to be with like, especially as you have children first, uh, that's, I don't think I put a pin in that before, but like the other obviously major season that women experience is birth. The whole process of having babies and then giving birth is like a nine month ordeal. It takes a long time. And so much life passes during that like very visible season. And so anyway, so there's that also as far as like things that affect women. And I think you guys, men kind of tune in at the point of the birth um, or maybe when the belly shows is when you guys are like, oh, there's something happening here. Well, well that's our season, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Something's coming to harvest. Um, so it took me a while to figure out with our family how we were going to run the seasons here. And it took me a long time to figure out um, kind of to separate a little bit the the picture I had of, you know, uh, Halloween town style, like trick or treating and things in the ho- in the fall and like these really clear, you know, fantasy pictures I had of how my my kids would be and stuff. And to start mapping that onto actual reality. And it's like, what is the essence I'm actually trying to achieve out of that? Sometimes we get really fixated on a picture we want to have. We're like, I want to have this experience. And then we're very frustrated with the fact that, you know, Christmas light observations with our three-year-old is not as idyllic as I thought it was going to be. And this is actually really annoying. And where are the lights? And it's like, it's a whole thing. Yeah. But starting to see what is the spirit you want to bring in this season, in this time of year? What are the things you want to draw your attention to? And which are the things that you want to spend your energy trying to manufacture? You'll end up a lot more satisfied with those seasonal celebrations. And your attention actually, it will work. Your attention will actually be drawn to the things you're paying attention to when you're saying, what can I, when your focus is on what is the the spirit or the the mood I'm trying to invoke here. What am I trying to get out of this? You can let some of the details go, but still get the spirit you're trying to achieve. Yeah. And, 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 and one thing you sort of lightly touched on without bringing up exactly is that the, the, I feel like the essence of seasonality is not about imposing your desires on mm-hmm. nature around you. I mean, obviously you want to do that. You want to bend your environment to suit you, but the, the, the bearing the seasons and seasonality in mind as a, as a kind of default mode of approaching life begins with accepting nature as it is. Mm -hmm. And it begins with acceptance and, and observation saying, how are things not, not how would I like them to be, which is the sort of, frictionless digital ideals and a little nature. bit of a hero's desire too he's like how should he's ideal he's an idealist how yes. should it be yes in a an idealist in a philosophical sense um, of of the the idea being in some sense more real than the physical reality that we actually experience and and see and the approach of seasonality to life is the opposite it's it's what how are things actually mm-hmm. in immediately around me? And I think the beauty of seasonality is that if you actually begin with that approach, you are far more likely to actually successfully bend your environment around you. And you might find that the desire to impose this philosophical ideal of how the world should work just dissipates like smoke it was like the the desire itself came from a feeling of frustration that itself arose from being out of tune with Mm -hmm. and out of sync with the seasons around you absolutely i i also just a little more globally than just like what we do you know per year obviously having kids it makes you a lot more aware of like how are we going to mark these things you know sort of how will we raise the children um but on a on a slightly bigger than that scale i'm also very aware of the fact that like we live obviously in a digital age i did i recently buy my kids a little toy cell phone yes i did because you, you know what have. i probably should not have however it was should on sale have. this is the lie that every woman tells themselves when they go to target I'll, okay i'll let you know when they when they do a a, a meth sale at work ah <laughs> okay you're going to tell me what that means <laughs> I mean, it does go on sale every once in a while. 
<laughs> I think it might have I think it might have fentanyl in it though, so we'll have to be careful. Well, okay, so I didn't get it off the street. I got it at Target, okay. Um That's even worse. That's made in China. That's guaranteed to have fentanyl in it. Okay, so look, anyway. Uh part of the reason I my rationalization for why I got and it's a like I mean it has buttons and it has numbers on it and it's not a real phone it's not a phone it's not a phone it's not a phone it's a very much a like a toy baby phone um the re the justification I had for it was that my kids are obviously aware of the fact that I'm on my phone all the time my phone is a physical object that is basically on my person all the time yeah. I work on my computer and my computer is in their playroom I live in a d digital age. The kids will sometimes get out something that kind of looks like a keyboard. Anything that like folds in half, they'll be like, I'm doing my work. I'm answering emails so we can make money because that's what I do for a living. And that's what they see modeled in front of them all the time. So I'm not going to try and I when before we had kids, I, yeah. I had this beautiful idyllic idea that I would keep my phone plugged in to a wall all the time and be like a 1990s mom who only used her phone uh, when the like when someone called like over there next to the wall well, and, and then i had a newborn and i was up nursing in the middle of the night and i spent a lot of time scrolling on the internet and so i was like well i guess that ship sailed so i'm trying not to beat myself up for the fact that like i had an ideal but i live in a reality where my banking is on my phone my grocery shopping is on my phone my social media is on my phone my yoga studio is on my phone everything is on my phone and that's just that's the yeah. season we're in. So well, I'm not fighting the, it. It's the it's the it's the in the in the broader historical sense, it's this season that right. our generation is in. Yeah. And I think uh, I was trying to be this heroic man against time living with my flip phone, <laughs> my little first that Kyocera super tough phone that died after it fell off a six foot ladder. Um <laughs> and then I went with the cheap option. But like well, working with hang a on. your cheap option that was also for the geriatric with very large buttons. <laughs> yes, yes. It it does the, the the grandpa whistle whenever you send the text. It's beautiful. But like that was great for a while, but like I was I was in a sense fighting against the time. Now you know accepting the seasonality of the culture and world you live in doesn't mean accepting all of its vices along with it mm -hmm. the the acceptance of the reality is the beginning of recognizing the potential pitfalls mm -hmm. so that you can hopefully avoid the vices and and learn to use the the tools of technology um technology in this case but other seasonal mm -hmm. implements in other cases uh in a in a way that uh that hopefully avoids some of those pitfalls yeah, I mean, did we, did it suddenly become, <laughs> did I have to implement a no phones at the table rule with my four-year-old? Yes. But you know what? It held mom and dad to that rule too, because you know what? That's a good rule. And, and she and, learns and internalizes that rule at four, hopefully that'll lead to better outcomes when she's 14. Right. And I, you know, if, if all they learn about computers for a long time, I'm trying to keep them very much in in toys that are toys open-ended normal human regular toys um if they learn that the primary purpose of computers is boring work stuff you know that will help keep them off of it a little bit longer i don't think there's anything i can do to resist the pull of video games for young men i think well that will just have to be the next device you know a vice that we will have to navigate at some point but um I'm trying to, the the importance to me is the juxtaposition between things like the technology that's prevalent in our lives all the time and the living, breathing animals that are in our backyard that we take care of all the time. The plants that we need to, I mean, it's one thing to tell your kids, don't step on your toys and break them. It's another th thing to say, don't step on that pumpkin. It's trying to grow. Like it's getting bigger. We need to, in fact, we should probably it's water it. It's a living it. thing. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, you can, for me, a lot of seasonality is not fighting the energy of the people in my house who I'm responsible for. And it's also uh, balancing the things that, because there are things that you can do to bring more of the seasonality into your life and less. And so if I have, to, if there are areas where I have to bring less seasonality into my day and into my life, I like to juxtapose it with something that brings a little bit more. 
Um, my kids are very aware of like my canning habits and sourdough. My kids will bring me a jar and say, look at my sourdough starter. And I'm like, this is the most brilliant. I'm so proud yeah. of myself that this is what they learned. Well, and, 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 and that's an interesting idea of, of the idea of, of making things more seasonal. It, it's almost a, like a, it's almost a false frame because this, the seasons carry on whether we're going to acknowledge them or not. And I feel like, and, and maybe this will be a point to close things out on because we've been going for almost 45 minutes now. Um, like the seasons carry on whether we acknowledge them or not. The the digital alternative lives that people live in on Skyrim and on Twitter and on various other social media and on like crypto charts and like wherever else they go to hide from the sun and the moon and the like the forces of history and of the weather and of you know the 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 social and 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 more like the, just the please. just the 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 physical world around them mm -hmm. like those things Th those digital escapes will fail at some point, whether f because an, a, a random EMP goes off and shuts everything down, or you just get spontaneously bored of it and suddenly decide you can't take any more frost giants or whatever. Um, like you, you, and you just have to get out and, and face the real world again, mm -hmm. or any number of like m momentary, like breakdowns, between those two extremes, the physical seasons of the world will still carry on around you and unfamiliarity with them, hiding from them will just mean you have more catch up work to do eventually. Exactly. Um, the more we can make the real world seem just as appealing as the digital world. I, I can't fight that the digital world will exist in our house, but I can make the rest of the world I can let it in. It's sort of like an opt in. You have to choose to let it in. But once you do, you realize just how vivid and just how interesting and just how worthwhile it truly is. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm, I'm never going to be able to eradicate the internet from my household. But at the same time, I can put goats in my backyard and make spending time with them just a little more appealing. Yeah, I, I want to I know we're, we're coming up on a long one, but here, but I wanted to close with a uh, a story that me and James Keenan, uh, my favorite musician, shared um, about. Uh, well, he was. He is the lead singer of Tool. For those of you who don't know, everyone knows. Um, <laughs> but like he's, he was talking. He did a video a couple, like a year or two ago, about um, Easter, mm -hmm. and how he and his family were doing a little. Um, they have these chickens on their at their farm at their. Uh, uh, I could do see a sellers. <laughs> well, yeah, whatever. And and one of the chickens ran off, and so they had to go hunt it down. And this was within like a week of Easter or so, um, and so they had to go out and hunt down and find this this chicken. And they found her eventually. She was okay. She hadn't been carried off by raccoons or coyotes or whatnot, um, but she had laid an egg, and so they also collected the egg that she had laid often hiding somewhere and the the phenomenon of the easter egg hunt is a it's a it's a play act it's just a fun thing we do it almost feels like a kind of escapism but it isn't and his point was that it's a it's a callback and it's a kind of burning into your own pattern recognition memory this thing that we used to do way back when we were starving of hunting around to find that little round ball of protein and sustenance that might carry, you know, some member of your family through another day. But it's, but it's, um, you know, ritualized into this, into this event that reminds you of the seasons. Mm -hmm. And as with, um, hero cults of the past, you reenact the tragedies of the hero to remember them and, and hopefully in doing so um, perhaps avoid some of the tragedies that they had to go through as, as compensation for the suffering that they endured on your behalf. 
I think that's a very good place to wrap it up. Yeah. Um, choosing to be more seasonal is really just a, a, it's a frame of your attention. And it's about paying attention to where some of these source things come from and then just kind of letting it in. Um, it's it's once you start doing it, it's funny because they kind of layer on to each other and it becomes easier and easier to slip further and further into just writing the rhythms of the day. And I think, you know, it's something certainly I shepherd the most as a female who's at home all the time with all the kids and all the animals. Um, and I think it comes very intuitively to me, but it's definitely a joint effort that we've worked together to create um a harmonious, balanced life that is in the era that we're in. And also, you know, uh, we're a little bit at odds with the average person, perhaps. Very few people have goats in the suburbs. But <laughs> um, <laughs> but they wish they did. Oh, everyone wishes they did. <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> they don't know how hard they are to contain, but that yeah. is okay. Uh, that's, a, that's a podcast for a future date on, on goats and goat poop. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. Wrap us up, babe. All right. Well, uh, that's that's it for this episode on seasonality. I think we've had enough beer for a few days mm-hmm. now. It's the tis the season, and we will uh, come back hopefully next week with even more interesting stuff about seasons and other Greek things. Thanks for listening. <laughs>